Welcome to Emerging Franchise Brands, the podcast that introduces you to the visionary founders of America's fastest growing franchise opportunities. We'll also hear from industry pros as they share insights on what it really takes to achieve the elusive milestone of 100 plus locations. I am your host, Frank Fumi, founder of i9 Sports, and my 20 year journey from inception to acquisition has given me a unique perspective on how to succeed in franchising. Join me as we welcome today's guest. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. On today's show, I have the co-founder and CEO of Vicious Biscuit, George McLaughlin. George, how are you today? Doing great. George, thanks for being on the show. Um, okay, so Vicious Biscuit, what a cool name. I love it. Yeah, it was. I, I I love it too. I got to give Michael Greeley the credit, my partner in it. But uh, it's 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 fun. So it's a fun name. it is a fun name. So you guys met back in in 2016, right? Yeah. So the end of 2016, kind of when Michael was first forming Vicious Biscuit, kind of as a catering company. I read an article about him, raving review about his biscuits that he brought to a, to a catering event. And I called him up and I said, listen, man, if your biscuits are half as good as your name is, I, we got to meet. And so sure enough, the next morning, I met him at his house, 830 in the morning. He had his biscuits there. He had his fried chicken, had a few other things that were amazing. And I just asked him, I said, hey, man, what do you want to do with this? Uh -huh. And he said he wanted to do a food truck. I said, I'm a bricks and mortar kind of guy. I said, I think this thing will work. Let's put it together. And so we spent about a year kind of building out the menu, trying to get a, a you know, the location that we are actually in right now, mm -hmm. designing the kitchen, designing the flow, and put it all together and opened December twenty second, two thousand eighteen. Nice. And where where was that? This was in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina, so suburb just just outside of Charleston, uh, just across the bridge from Charleston. So, so George, did you um, when you got together with Michael and decided on this? Uh, you know, growing this thing through brick and mortar. Did you have uh, an idea of franchising initially? What was part of the uh, the initial vision for the company? Sure. I mean, you know, before you get into franchising, you kind of got to do the proof of concept, right? So we wanted to open the first location, tweak it. And then in, while well, we were trying to open a second location, literally a year later in Somerville, South Carolina, which is just outside of Charleston, you know, kind of had some delays with construction, went right into COVID. And we literally opened July 22nd, uh, 2020, right in the heart of COVID. It was kind of our proof of concept to see if we could franchise it out. It took off. And so I then decided to say, look, before we really launch the franchising, I need to have at least six or seven corporate locations for real like support to be able to start franchising. Because I was involved in franchising almost 30 years ago. And I knew it when we did it with only four locations at that time, we really didn't have enough support staff for the franchisees. So Really, the kind of delay of us launching franchising was to make sure, one, you have proof of concept, and two, you have kind of the support for those franchisees, because that's the biggest part, you know, that's the most important part of franchising, in my opinion. Absolutely. So, George, what's your background then? Let's go back to the, uh, I think it was back to the mid-90s, right? Yeah, now we're going to age me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I uh, was fortunate enough, I attended the, the University of Mississippi, Ole Miss in Oxford, Mississippi, and kind of really at the end of my sophomore year, I want to stay there that summer and, and work. And I was fortunate enough to get a job at McAllister's Deli and fell in love with it, worked full time my junior and senior year. When I graduated, uh, Doc Nukem, Chris Nukem, two founders kind of asked me to move to Jackson. They were starting their franchise division at that time. Wow. Uh, moved there in, in June of Golly, 1995. And uh, we've trained the first franchisees. Boy, I'll tell you, you know, if we could find a way to mess it up, we did it really well. Uh, <laughs> it was quite the, uh, you know, getting your MBA in franchising over the next year and a half. And yep. it, was, it was a good ride, but learned a, a heck of a lot. And then, you know, after that, I was there for about a year and a half and became the first employee to franchise out. So as I opened my own franchise, locations of McAllister's in Columbia, South Carolina. I then kind of came back and, and started the FAC, the Franchise Advisory Council. So I went from the franchisor side to the franchisee side. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to be, you know, to kind of sit on both sides of the table. And then when we started the FAC uh, committee, it was really cool because you then jumped back over on the franchisor side. So right. Learn, 
a lot in those 10 years of being a franchisee. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, it's it's not every day that, you know, we talk to somebody that's in franchising that has been on you know both sides. And you, you prove the point, though, about it's important that you understand how each other work and you have to work together. And I always say, you know, in franchising, the franchise or franchisee relationship is a, it's a push-pull relationship, right? It's so critical to make sure the franchisor understands the franchisee is its customer, mm-hmm. right? And that was the one thing, the reason why we started the FAC committee, because McAllister's management was going, you know, Dr. Newcomb took it as far as he could, brought in some some CEOs, some, you know, a C-suite management office, uh, which ended up buying them out uh, or buying them almost completely out. And then you you kind of had that, you saw the franchisor going one way and the franchisees going other. And so the, the, the creating the fact committee, which was not at first my idea was actually from another franchisee that came from a very large chain. And, you know, he kept telling me, he goes, look, you train the majority of these guys. You need to be the president of it. You need to start this committee. So really bringing the franchisor and the franchisees back together. Sure. You got to you got to understand that we are the customers of the franchisor and we should be partners with a franchisor. And that's that's very important. That's one of the things that I've really wanted to instill in our growth and Vicious Biscuit is to make sure that we pick the best partners, not just franchisees, but the big best partners who are really going to build the brand with us and, you know, really empower their employees to to develop the culture that we've already created here at Vicious Biscuit. Mm-hmm. And that's how we'll be successful. Yeah. You know, since the audience is a mix of, you know, other emerging founders and folks looking to invest in a franchise, George, I would love it if you could take a moment back to when you were part of that FAC um, group early on with McAllister's. And because I know that I, I talked to a lot of emerging founders that may not have gotten an FAC yet, and they feel like they're right at that junction where they really need to. Do you remember how many franchise locations McAllister's had when you guys well, we were launched probably the FAC? Anywhere between 35 to 40 locations. And now we were multi-unit at times. So mm-hmm. I, I think myself at that time, I probably had five or six locations. We had other franchise groups that had multiple unit locations. And the people that we brought on to the FAC committee we appointed to were multi-unit franchisees already mm-hmm. of McAllister's. And one of the gentlemen that we brought on, they were previously, I, I want to say they were a TGI Friday, Fridays franchisee. So they were already in, you know, considered like a number uh, in that franchise group but because of how large it was. And so we were still, you know, first name basis. And I think it was it was critical for us to create it at that time because it was really sh- the sharing of information, but to understand the pain points that franchisees were going through, going into new markets, the brand wasn't known in, you know, going into uh, different, you know, just really, I I guess it's really different markets and and, and different municipalities of uh, kind of a different customer customer base we were used to in the South. And so when McAllister started kind of going, you know, in the North and out West and, and um, really down South in Florida, uh, we, we really needed to have that kind of that diversity of, different areas from franchisees to understand what works and what doesn't work. Wow. You know, uh, Michael is so fortunate and lucky to, as much as you are lucky to have found him and the recipe and the company, uh, he's equally as lucky to have found you because having an opportunity to cut your teeth in franchising the way you did is, uh, you know, you don't run into people every day that are starting a brand out and have, have had that background. So you guys are, it's not like a dynamic duo. Yeah. Well, he has the fun job. He gets to create. (laughs) Well, okay. Let's talk about Vicious Biscuit and your franchise journey. So if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you, did you guys seek outside help in getting the franchise off the ground? Did you use outside consulting? Did you just use a franchise attorney? I say this because there are, again, the emerging founders are so curious that I talk to uh, on how everybody gets started. Well, you know, first first off, I was really kind of going back and forth what when and when or if we were going to franchise. Yeah. And and so as we were growing, you know, I kept on getting so many requests, so many emails, you know, bring it to our town. Hey, we want to franchise. Hey, we want to go. I mean, from all over the United States, even outside of this, you know, even outside of the United States, wow. we were getting requests. And so funny enough, I called up my old, the, the gentleman that I worked with, I actually trained Patrick Walls. He was our, he came actually from Framecorp, uh, hired on by McAllister's 
to be the in-house attorney to handle franchising. And I already told him, I called up Patrick. I said, listen, I don't know if you, you know you know what I'm doing. And I'm like, he goes, yeah, I, I've seen what you're doing. You got a really cool concept. And I said, Patrick, I'm on the fence. I'm, I'm getting so much request about franchising. Should I do it or should I not? And he says, absolutely. You got to build a brand. Franchising helps the brand across the board. And so I had already, you know, I went back when I, when we started really ramping up Vicious, I went back and hired my old, one of my old directors of operations who had been through kind of that franchise, you know, franchising with me with McAllister Stelly and even another franchise we were involved in. And I said, look, we got to start writing the policies and procedures because we got to act like every corporate locations we're opening up outside of Charleston, we treat it like a franchise mm -hmm. and because this will prepare us to be ready to help people start franchising. So we started already writing it. And then when I when I was talking to Patrick Walls, I said, listen, who should I hire to help us write the FDD? You know, we used to call it the UFOC back yes, in the day. Yes, we did. <laughs> but, so he said, listen, you need to call Mike Siebert. He's the one that did it 30 years ago with you in McAllister's Deli. Mm -hmm. He's got I franchise. They know how to write the book. And so we called Mike up and he said, look, let me see what you guys have done so far. And I already told him, I said, look, you know, you you kind of get this a la carte menu of how to write or do the FTD from, you know, from the FTD all the way through all your training, all your marketing, everything. And I said, you know, Mike, I, I just need you to do the legal side of this on the franchise. We already have all of you know, the back office, the training, you know, everything that that's needed to, to really run it. Right. And so it made our system a lot easier because we were, we were pretty much prepared because we're experienced. Now, someone who's not experienced in it, I would say by all means, it's worth its weight in gold to pay a, a business or a company like I franchise who's experienced in it because they will really, they'll really prevent you. They'll, one, they'll help you with time, right? Mm -hmm. Because time is the most valuable asset we have. For sure. And they'll help you to make sure it's structured correctly so you're not you know stumbling and having to go back and and you know rewrite things and recreate your kind of your franchise policy and your your, your operational procedures yeah and george you know what what makes you different is you didn't necessarily franchise because you were getting emails from people and you know, you're getting all of this inflow of, of leads. You had more than the idea. You already started implementing systems and processes. Obviously, you had the franchise background. I talked to some entrepreneurs from time to time that the reason why they want to franchise, they say strictly, is because, oh, my God, so many people are telling me I, I want to open one of these. And wouldn't you agree right. with somebody with your background? Wouldn't you agree that that is not a reason to franchise just because people are saying, I want to open one of these? Yeah, you do, you don't you, you you're absolutely right. You don't want to go out and just franchise because you think that's what people want, right? You got to be very careful in making sure that you have really strong policies and procedures and a culture established before you get into franchising because you know, it's the old saying the tail will wag the dog. Yeah. These franchisees will run all over you and next thing you know, it, they'll rip your brand apart. And they won't follow the policies and procedures and and, and it really we've seen it I, I mean i've i've been asked to consult multiple times with people trying to take a brand and franchise and i, I look at it and I go you're not ready and, and if you just think that you can go out and you know go on the internet and you know this new ai <laughs> right draw up a franchise agreement that is the worst thing you can do because it will get out from underneath you and run away from you and yeah. so Franchising is, is you got to be prepared for it and you better have great policies and procedures in place and systems in place before you ever think about it. Mm -hmm. You guys have six company owned locations. You got 10 franchises in the works. Sounds like, um, well, Akron, Ohio is going to be the first franchise. March to 1st. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, we're super excited about it. That's, yeah. that's great. What do you yeah. think? Uh, I would love to get more insight on this. What do you think it takes George to build a solid foundation for your franchise, especially with those, you know, first several units, because you know, the culture is so critical for that first dozen franchisees. Well, you know, it's, it's really anytime someone requests about franchising with us, I always tell them, look, go out, look at our competitors. If you go and check, I want you to check out every one of our competitors before you even tell me, Hey, I really want to franchise this. And if you still love us a hundred percent and come back and we'll talk about franchising first. Number two is why do you franchise, right? We already made 
all the capital investments, all the mistakes, all the what to do and what not to do in building these out and going locations, trying to understand where we're successful, where we're not successful, you know, what equipment works, what, you know, and so we've spent millions of dollars in building, you know, six locations to really figure out, hey, what works? And we'll we'll constantly be tweaking it and we'll learn. And this is the other good thing about franchising. We'll learn from our franchisees that have operational experience from a different concept or a different chain sure. that can come in and say, well, have you ever thought about this? You know, and so that's very valuable to us. But really going back to it is when I say to the first few franchisees coming into it is like, hey, you you should look at a franchise and you look at the royalty fees. And if you're not getting at least three times the return on the investment of the royalty fees you're paying, then don't do that franchise. Sure. Right. But I will tell you from our experience, you know, when they say, well, why don't I just go and create my own biscuit concept? Well, go right ahead. But we've already spent, you know, two years in the making millions of dollars of, of you know, figuring out what works and what not, doesn't work, you know, testing different equipment, to, you know, figuring out how to design a kitchen, where do we save cost, the, the, kind of everything. And so that's what when a new franchisee or somebody that's coming in is interested in it. And I, you know, that's the first thing I say to them is, right. This is why you franchise. Look at what we've already spent the time and money and headache to do. What uh, what are the aspirations for 2024 in terms of number of uh, new locations signed for, you're thinking? We're trying to be very methodical about that. When we flipped the switch in 1st of February of franchising of this year, I had 136 applications, like overnight. It was crazy. I mean, it just went straight up. It reminded me of that the show, the, uh, uh, the, not the bear, but you know, where the tickets just started printing out and I was just like, (laughs) Oh my God, what do I do? And, you know, we we carefully go through and interviewed every single one of them and talk to them. And out of those 136, we chose seven franchisees, seven great partners. And from that, you know, coming into 2024, we're really focused on opening those locations for those franchisees. And then We'll add, you know, three more, probably, you know, three to four more franchisees in 2024 and just really make sure that we're building them correctly mm-hmm. and finding the correct markets, really finding those concentric circles to where we where we go and develop more for the, the branding side of it and the distribution side of it. Sure. That's got to come into play. In oh, that. absolutely. It's a very important part. Yeah. Yeah. How do you know as, you know, as the CEO, what triggers your, your thought on knowing when you can scale more quickly and open more locations faster? People. Um, it's really having great people that can deliver the culture and the brand. And, and that's really what it is. Money's not the, the issue, right? Real estate's hard right now. Finding great locations is is pretty difficult. I'm going through that now. I've spent a lot of time you know, on the road with franchisees looking for locations. And I, and I just tell them straight out, let's be patient. We, we don't want to force a square peg in a round hole. You know, let's go out and find your first location. Let's make sure it's a home run. I was just in Indiana, the guys that are franchisees, and they have, they have three great locations. And, you know, two of them are great, will be great in 2025. And mm-hmm. I go, look, let's make sure your first one comes out of the gate strong. You can build your team, build your you know your staff to be able to handle the other two. So development and growth is 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 much easier. And that's what's important to us. And so for us to grow correctly and, and and grow well, one, it's going to take the people. That's what we really, I mean, we're hiring to the bench every day. And with our concept, it's very easy. We're getting great talent that is coming out because, I mean, our managers, they manage one shift. I mean, they work from seven to three. On the weekends, it's eight to three. They're at home with their families by 3.30. Yeah. They have lives. At our company Christmas party, I had more wives and, and spouses, I should say, because majority of our GMs are, are female, which is awesome. And, you know, their spouses would come up to me and say, it's awesome. My wife or husband loves to be in the restaurant business, but now they get to spend so much time with their kids and their, and their home and we get to know them and, and they're so passionate about the brand. And, you know, people ask us like, why don't you open up later? And I'm like, well, I don't want to. Right. And I was like, I love it that we're done by three. So it's been, it's been a great, it's been a lot of fun because if you don't have your family support, you can't, it's hard to run a great business and do the culture we have. I always say, look, we're in the entertainment business, not the restaurant business. Mm. And I want to get that entertainment for our staff and for our customers. So let, let's uh, get into that. How do you implement the entertainment side of the business? Having fun. It's simply that. Uh, I said, I said, I said, listen, 
I was, I was my own boss at 22 and I wanted to make sure that we were having fun all the time. And, you know, we had a, a saying and we still do to this day when my, when I had my old restaurant company called Mac restaurant corporation, it was very simple. Employees first, customers second. We take care of our employees. They'll take care of our customers. But on the entertainment side of it, we really teach our managers to work not around our employees, but through our employees and making sure that they're teaching them absolutely everything about the business, what everything costs, what we're doing in sales on a daily basis, you know, keeping them entertained in a sense of they're learning every day. And I say to every one of our employees, if you're not learning something new every day, then you're not doing yourself any good. You're not, you're not, you should always be growing and learning and asking questions and learning the business. And then we say to our, our, our managers is, Hey, you give me two great years. You learn this business. You show that you can empower people and work through people, not around them. And you can deliver that culture. We'll back you on any being a franchisee. Just same opportunity that happened for me. Mm -hmm. I want to give that to my employees. Has that helped you with the labor market being so tight, having that no, sort of strategy? Absolutely. And it, it's, I tell them, man, this is your restaurant. So it's like, all six locations, which we're about to open our seventh location here, first of February in Columbia, South Carolina. I tell every GM, you are a franchisee. Mm -hmm. You run it like it's your own business. And the best thing you can do is hire someone smarter and better than you to fill your shoes. And don't be afraid of that. And so I tell them, you should feel like every day when you leave here at 3.30 that you have taught somebody something new. It just has empowered them, yeah. has given them excitement to run the restaurant. And it's awesome. I love watching it. It's it's arguably the most rewarding thing to me in this business. That is awesome. You get it, man. You get it. Um, who is your ideal franchise owner? Someone who can empower people. Not who's got the most money. It's really the best coach, the best you know, leader to empower people to want to be successful and to strive and learn the business. Mm -hmm. That's the best franchisee. I've had the guys that come up and they're big corporate and they'll be like, yeah, we got a hundred units over here and we just want to backfill our restaurants and all that. I'm like, hey man, that sounds great. Good luck. I want the person who's going to be as energetic as us and say, we want to grow this and make sure that every one of our employees feels like it's their restaurant. And that's who we're looking for. So are, are the franchise locations typically... Uh, owner operated or manager operated? Well, we, if it is an owner, if we want it to be owner operated, right? Okay. But if it's a owner who doesn't have man, that doesn't have restaurant experience, mm -hmm. we tell them to go out there and get an operator. And that operator that they bring in has to have at least 10% of ownership in the business. I always say to them, who better to watch your money than someone watching their own? So yes. I was like, give them that opportunity, give them the ability to run it because they're going to run it far better than anybody else. And so we, we, that's one of our franchise policies. If you're not going to be day to day, right, then you have to have an operator that is going to live, breathe, and encourage and empower that business. Fantastic. Uh, what about single locations versus multi unit? Are you allowing well, for multi unit franchise opportunities or strictly yeah, we've, one to two? We've seasons? actually already sold multi units to okay. individuals that already kind of have that base. When we have a franchisee come in that already have restaurants, Mm -hmm. We actually do, we secret shop the restaurants. We've actually turned down some possible franchisees because we went out, looked at the restaurants, surveyed them. But more importantly, we asked their managers, like, what do you enjoy about the business that you're in right now? Mm -hmm. How do you like working for this owner? And when, if we're getting negative feedback, we're not going to award that person a franchise. And so that's very important to us. Single operators, we've sold two, only two single units right this moment. But that is for them, they're, you know, they know that they're going to do more in the area, but most of them have come in and, and kind of protected their area and bought out. You know, we have a 10 unit operator. We have a five unit. Um, we have two tens, actually, I should say. Mm -hmm. And so, but they already have operational experience. They already have kind of that, that staff and that team that loves it, that they're actually adding to their portfolio to reward those managers that work 80 hours for them. They're working the multi different shifts, you know, a, a day they're working late at night, getting back there in the morning. You know, this is kind of a, kind of a thank you very much for everything you did building these other brands. Right. Now here we're going to give you a really cool brand that you get to manage one shift. Nice. 
And uh, George, I'm curious to know about the overall vision for the company. So because you have six company owned, right? And we've got 10 franchises coming. What's the thought on the strategy? Are we going to continue open company owned with franchises? Yeah, my goal is to stay at least 20% franchise. I mean, franchisor, okay. company owned locations um, for multiple reasons. One, support is the most important thing. You know, keeping us opening corporate locations allows us to be able to, you know, we say hire to the bench, but having that roster that we can go out and go to one of our GMs and say, hey, do you want to, you know, break away from this restaurant and go open another location? And we say that to our GMs because we want our general managers to go out and see something new. Mm -hmm. And then we also want that GM to be able to turn around and look back at their restaurant and say, well, how did it do when I was gone for a week? or two weeks, you know, while opening other locations. And it also gives them, you know, it, it takes the blinders off because if they're doing it every day, you know, it kind of opens their eyes to new markets, to seeing new things, to seeing different setups. And so opening company locations is very important to us. Okay. One, it allows us to test new things in, in different markets that we'll be in. Mm -hmm. But two is really the support to our franchisees. Well, you know, there's the two schools of thought on that. Some people believe I need to have both, you know, and it's great to have one cash flow of company owned. Secondly, maybe to use for seeding of other markets. And then the other school of thought is I could either only be a franchise or only company owned. I can't do both. It's really difficult. So what do you say to those folks that say, man, George, I gotta, I'm either, I gotta be all in or all out. Yeah. I would say, be careful with that. I mean, I, I get, I understand why some think that way, mm -hmm. but I also think that you got to walk the talk. So, you know, I, I know of multiple franchises that only have one location and, you know, they grew up and, and you know, they had problems with it and there was lawsuits around it and all that. We, I like to be able to say to the franchisee, hey, I, I, I understand because we've experienced this in this market or mm -hmm. we've experienced that in that market. I, I think you, you really, again, it goes back to the franchise support. If I only had one restaurant and I'm opening 20 locations and there's only 12 months in the year and they're overlapping when they're opening. Where am I going to have that team? You know, you can't just stockpile them in a restaurant. Right. Now I get to pull from all different locations. Right. And what, what that allows us is, is we're certifying trainers. And then we know that we are protecting the brand that we're doing the same thing in each and every restaurant because now I'm empowering these people to be corporate trainers and to go open those things. And then if they're in certain markets, I can ask that GM, say, hey, listen, I want you to be a franchise rep today. You know, kind of spice up their, their life and their job and say, right. why don't you go tour this market for the next week and a half or two weeks? I mean, I did that when I was a GM, you know, when I was 21 years old in Jackson, Mississippi. You know, Dr. Nuka would send me out and say, look, this franchise, he's struggling. He needs to learn how to make money. Go spend a week with him. Mm -hmm. And it was awesome. And it taught me so much. And I was very fortunate to have that. Now, I was also doing that because... At the time we only had, I think we were open our fifth location. So we were <laughs> stretched in and we were traveling all over, but thank God we were young and you know, we you can do we it. Had that flexibility. And yeah. We were, we were tall and bulletproof. Yeah, totally. Well, I, I want to explore this further because there are founders out there that they're excited about seeding markets with company owned locations as a way of getting the exposure to start, start the franchise. Of course, you know, at the same time, want to caution people that they shouldn't just open company owned locations for the sake of, you know, seeding markets only that you have to have a, you have to have a really good mix. So I'm curious to know what your, your strategy is on placement of the company owned locations. Is it specifically in markets where you, you hope to grow franchises around there, or is it certain regions that you want to continue to build company owned? What, what makes well, a good company location? Well, it's kind of funny because when I open these corporate locations, we, I, the mindset wasn't that I'm, well, I mean, because we're in Charleston, mm -hmm. we're in Charlotte, North Carolina, we're in Boone, North Carolina, we're in Wilmington, North Carolina, and we're in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. You know, and they're like, why are you so spread out? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm truly testing how easy our operations are that we can have these guys, you know, five hours away and still be able to deliver the quality that we were able to do here. But two was really the first step was test of market, right? Figure out where we really thrive. But number two is, yes, now that I have the corporate locations, we'll build up corporate locations that will give support to Florida. You know, we'll have the North Carolina be able to give, you know, North Carolina and in, in Virginia. I mean, we purposely did it in the college market because that's where I started. And so we wanted to be able to recruit 
some of the best, you know, eager managers coming up who are going to be your next franchisees, you know? And so I think, you know, and I hope that this answers your question is as we grow, I do know that there's some that will go, okay, we're going to open a corporate location out here. And then hopefully a franchisee will come and pick it up. We're having that very thing today where we're having a group in Charlotte who's coming. They wanted the whole Charlotte market. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes sense because they're able to, we're able to grow together and build a brand, especially when you go in those big markets, right? You really got to come in and open two or three at a time, you know, and really get that brand out. We've really gone on the mindset of it's a very simple concept that's easy to execute. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, you hire and empower the right people. You can do it extremely well. And we've really certain strategically, you know, put our franchisees is really for that, you know, the distribution side of it and those concentric circles to really for the branding side of it. Mm, okay. What's, uh, what's the investment range for the franchise? Anywhere from, you know, 650 to a million one. Okay. Um, and, and those are because there are the corporate locations that we've built. That a million one was really for delays of COVID. Uh, it took us nine months to get a water heater. That was a lot of fun. Oh. Uh, and, you know, we've, we 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 were paying dead rent, um, you know, trying to get one open with delays of COVID and inspections. And, you know, the, the hardest part two years ago was health departments, you know, they were on a skeleton crew. They weren't going out and, and doing inspections, building apartments the same way. We experienced everything. And so now it's getting a little bit easier. You know, building permits are getting easier to obtain. So it's, you know, we're seeing our costs come back down. Um, we've really valued engineer. Uh, what we do inside the four walls and really in the kitchen side of it, you know, I grew up in manufacturing, so it's all return on investment. So when right. we look at a piece of equipment, we don't necessarily look at what it costs. We look at, well, how well is it going to last and what's the return on investment? When is it going to pay itself off? I mean, we have a $7,000 machine that simply crushes oranges so we can have the freshest orange juice there possibly is. And people go, well, George, I think it's $7,000. I'm like, yeah, but it paid for itself in six months. Right. You know, so uh, that's how we kind of look at it. Yeah. And what about leasing? How, how difficult is it right now for, for the franchisees? I mean, I heard you mention earlier about uh, telling that one franchisee, look, just slow down. We'll have the right location. Might not be till 2025, but what are you seeing right now on leases? Are, are people? It's, oh, it's yeah. tough. I think it's tough because, you know, this is tough to say. I gotta be careful how I say it, sure. but you know, you know, when the, the, the PPP came out, it really kept a lot of restaurants afloat that shouldn't have been afloat, right? Yeah. And so it just dragged on the inevitable. Now we're starting to see that come about. And then really kind of, you know, look, we're already in the recession in the restaurant industry. I don't care what anybody says. Well, I'm seeing it, especially in the nighttime white, white tablecloth restaurant industry is really tough. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing it across the board. It's all over the news. And this really will test. I, I've already been through three of these. And so it really kind of weeds out the the non-players. And this is a great time to grow franchising. And so we we kind of look at it straight out as, as leasing. We say, be very patient. Don't try to rush it. You know, we're not going to sit here and tell you, well, you got to have this open in six to nine months. No, we've said to all of our franchisees is like, look, as long as we know that you are aggressively looking, but being very smart about it right? and being methodical in what you're choosing, then by all means, we're not going to tell you you're out of time. We're going to be there for you. We get it. We understand. I used to be a franchisee. It was very difficult. You know, I went through the high times and the low times. And as we're coming out of these low times, this is the best time to grow. And so, you know, we're seeing the retail sector. So the cool thing about Vicious is we're actually doing a location in Mississippi on this. As I, I told the, the realtors, like, don't go look for restaurants that are about to close. Go look at the retail locations, right? If you find a really good lifestyle center, those retail locations got killed during COVID. Mm -hmm. And the internet and Amazon and all that. I mean, you look at Best Buy. Best Buy is a showcase store now, right? You go in and look at the TV and then you go online and order it from Best Buy and it's delivered to your house. So you don't have to throw that in your car anymore. You know, right. it's, it's the same thing we're seeing with the retail side of it. People, the retail wants to downsize, but in other new markets, though, we're also running into issues that there was a real hold on development and where interest rates are right this moment. Mm -hmm. New locations are kind of hard to find because people aren't developing as much right this moment. Mm -hmm. And development it became very difficult. You got you to gotta be very careful in what you're doing, but really think outside the box and finding locations. Sure. Yeah. Uh, George, what's, what's your vision for the company? Have you have any idea on how many locations? 
Look, I don't. Vicious, I, you know, I, could be I, nationwide. Yeah, I can't wait to work. Yeah, you know, I can't wait to work five hundred units. No, I'm I'm here to take us to as far as I can. And like I say to all my GMs, man, hire somebody smarter and better to fill your shoes. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take it as far as I know that I can personally. Mm -hmm. And then I'll bring someone in to help me take it to that next level. But look, you know, I regretted the day I sold out all of my McAllisters. I mean, at 17 restaurants, built it up in less than 10 years, sold it before the world went nuts, Uh, had another franchise that we were involved in. And it was weird. I mean, it was just timing. And now I look Mm -hmm. at it and say, my kids are really expressing interest in coming into this business they love it. Uh, my daughter went from a full ride in nursing to going to Ole Miss. Shocked us, surprised us to follow my footsteps in business, and she loves it. She, you know, she's sitting here working today mm-hmm. while she's home for Christmas. She loves it. She she loves the interaction of the restaurant industry. So my vision, look, let's take it as best we can. Um, I'm not going to say we got to have this many by this time and that many. Yeah, I set goals for my team, mm-hmm. but I also say. Let's set smart goals that we know that we're going to achieve without forcing mistakes. And that's what's so important to us. Sure. What advice do you give to people that are considering joining Vicious Biscuit as a franchisee? Best advice is have fun. (laughs) First, (laughs) truthfully, what I say to this, and I I actually was just speaking to the the Air Force base on retired, you know, Air Force uh, captains and, you know, uh, they're they're retiring and they're going into the, the public sector. And I said, listen, before you ever think about doing franchising or, or anything, you got to make sure you're 100 percent committed and love 100 percent of what you're doing, because if you have 99 percent love and 1 percent doubt, that 1 percent doubt is going to shine brighter than your 99 percent committal and, and love and passion to do what you're doing. So I say that with our franchisees. I said, listen, you know, you have to go out and look at our competitors. Mm-hmm. If you like one of our competitors better, go do that. I said, but if you're coming on and being a partner with us and being a franchisee with us, I want you to be 100% committed. This is the best thing you're going to do. Just like we were looking at locations in, in Auburn, uh, Alabama the other day, and the, and the wife just, she's a lover. She's just got so much energy. And she's like, I don't love this location. I said, then let's not talk. About it. <laughs> right. I'm like, let's, let's not next. Let's yeah. go on. Right. Because, it, because, because if it doesn't work, yeah. Gonna, you're going to hear, I told you so. I knew it wasn't right. going to, right? Yeah, and you got to have the passion for it. You got to go in there and go, I love this. And right. because I don't want you to start building it and go, all right, I'm waking up in the middle of the night doubting that I, why did I choose this? I wasn't 100% committed to this location. Sure. Don't do it. You know, let's go find one that you're 100% committed, that you're excited about, you're ready to get it open. That's the only way to do it. Life's too short. Absolutely. Um, George, if someone was interested in getting some more information on the franchise opportunity, uh, how can they get that info? Pretty simple. Uh, our website, viciousbiscuit.com. <laughs> it's V-I-C-I-O-U-S, B-I-S-C-U-I-T.com. Simple enough. Very neat. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, George, I always finish with the tip jar because the franchise community is just so generous with giving information. Um, if I was an entrepreneur looking to franchise my concept, What's one piece of advice you'd give me? Wow. The, you know, because there's a lot of advice, right? And oh, yeah. The first and foremost uh, piece of advice I give you is, are you fully committed and understand and know your brand? That is probably the most important thing. And then can you deliver it with your with a passion? And does your team believe in it as much as you do? And if you have that, then you've, you you're starting on the right footing. George, thank you so much for being on the show. I appreciate hey, this. was great. Me. I'm looking forward to Vicious Biscuit coming to Tampa one day. I will definitely check it out. That's great. We look forward to being down there. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for tuning into the Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast. For additional insights, guest applications, and to stay connected, visit us at efbpodcast.com. The Emerging Franchise Brands Podcast is for entertainment purposes only, and the views expressed do not necessarily represent those of Emerging Franchise Brands, its host Frank Fumi, or Emerging Franchise Group, LLC. Any discussed franchise or investment opportunity requires thorough investigation, obtaining proper disclosure documents, and expert consultation before making any investment decisions. The podcast and its host do not offer professional advice or endorsements, and they hold no responsibility for actions, representations, accuracy, or consequential damages related to the podcast content.